And it hit the net and I was like, yes! Um, I will introduce you, but I don't really think I need to introduce you because everybody knows who you are. So, <laughs> okay, anyways, describe yourself in three words. Three words, soccer player or person? Um, away from football. Away from football, okay. I would say empathetic, introverted, passionate. Does Zola want to add anything or if he can? Oh no, I, I made him go upstairs so he wasn't, he's not listening to this. <laughs> okay, we'll get into football. What is the weirdest pronunciation pronunciation of your surname you've heard? Uh, I think Saberbun. And so they changed the U to a V and then they forgot there was an R in the last part of it. So Saberbun. I actually had a jersey that said Saber Brun that I had to get changed the first game of the end of your cell season, which is like, end of your cell. <laughs> Welcome. People always ask, what did you get when you got um, in 2009 drafted? And I'm like, what do you mean when I got? We didn't get jerseys, you get the scar. <laughs> <laughs> These little kids have no idea uh, how we paved the way. Okay, what is your earliest football memory? Earliest football memory, I was playing at this local park in St. Louis. My parents put me into like a little co-ed league, which is played on the weekends. And I was playing with like a bunch of my schoolmates. And I remember shooting on goal and I couldn't get the ball off the ground and just being so frustrated and just training and training and training. And finally got the ball off the ground and it hit the net. And I was like, yes. That's like one of my earliest memories. And then you knew you were a center back or? Oh no, man. I was like a center midfielder up until regional team. And then, you know, everyone was a center midfielder. So they're like putting center midfielders everywhere. And they're like, you are going to go to center back. And literally it like everything clicked. Yeah, makes sense. Okay. What was your first game you went to like professional game? Uh, probably the first game I went to, I think University of North Carolina traveled to play University of Missouri. So Mizzou. And so my dad took me to that game. And so I don't even know how old I was. I was probably like nine or 10. So like pretty young and it wasn't professional, obviously it was collegiate. Professional was probably uh, at a training camp for a youth national team. They took us to a Philadelphia game in the WUSA. Okay. Yeah. Who was your idol when you growing up? So I would say Carla Oberbeck uh, was national team center back, leader for the team for a really long time just someone who has a lot of presence on the field. I actually saw her play in 1999 at the World Cup and just like, just being awed by her because you could just tell that she commanded everything around her. If you guys don't know who that is, I highly recommend that you should just go Google because I'm sure many people have not heard that name. Um, if you hadn't become a professional footballer, what do you think you'd be doing now? I think I would be in publishing. So I okay. love reading. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, so like reading manuscripts, helping people write books. Uh, I would love to be able to write a book, but I think it would be the most boring book ever. So I think helping other creative people write books uh, would really be like right up my alley. Like more autobiographies or like more like sci-fi? Fiction. fiction. Yeah, definitely like sci-fi fantasy. Okay. Um, what is the biggest sacrifice you've had to make um, to get where you are? Oh, geez. Um, so it might be, some might be light and some might be quite. <laughs> um, I mean, I, when I went to play in Norway for those four months, um, after that first WPS season, I missed my brother's wedding. Oof. And so like, whenever I tell people I miss my brother's wedding, they're kind of like, you're insane. And I'm like, it kind of seemed normal, normal to me. Um, but I think looking back, like that was kind of a bad one to miss my brother's wedding. <laughs> Whoops. I think it just comes, like you said, the norm to, for us, because at that point you have no idea what, at that point you're just kind of getting started and you had no idea what the future held. So you just thought, okay, I have to do this for now, live in the moment. You never yeah. thought in 10 years you'd be still playing national team and I guess now playing at home, you know? It's like you had no idea where things were going after the WS, WPS folded. Oh, for sure. I support your decision, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Okay, if you could choose one superpower, what would it be? Uh, one superpower, I'd probably go with either flying or invisibility. Those are like tied for first. And wh why? 
what would be well have you ever had flying dreams where you're like literally you can fly in your dream it's like it's pretty rare i don't think i can't say that i have okay so i've had them maybe like a handful of times in my life and i wake up i mean it's such an amazing feeling in the dream and i wake up and i'm so like so sad that i woke up and so i imagine if i could do that all the time i'd just be like the most happy person like flying was awesome and then invisibility i actually think i could like do good things like i could uh well, i could do bad things too i could like rob banks and stuff but i could also like be good and be like robin hood and like steal from the rich and give to the poor yeah. okay um have you done like skydiving or i guess in the states you have the i did it in houston where you go in and it's like you're on that big wind tube and then you like you know what i'm talking about Cause it's, yeah i've never done it though it's actually quite cool. You go in, you have a suit and you have a hat and then you go in this wind tunnel and you like start on your stomach. And then it, it's the same thing as like you're skydiving, but obviously it's, you're not actually gonna get injured. You should do it. There has to be one after <laughs> this whole quarantine thing. Okay, straight to your club career. Can you tell us about, <laughs> we were talking about this, your draft day in 2008? So, the draft for the first season of the WPS was on the internet. And so I was actually in college, in class, and like, not even sure, I didn't have like the technology to even check. And then I think I found out afterwards that I had gone like third or something to the Washington Freedom. So I was like, sick, that's perfect. Yeah, oh, how far it's come, you know? <laughs> and we brought up, we brought up you going to ROA and you played there 2009. Why ROA? I mean, obviously the league and stuff, but why did you choose row out of the teams you go to? So my college coach, Steve Swanson, had a connection to the coach at Rua um, because one of our Virginia teammates, Sarah Huffman, you know Sarah, okay. um, yeah. she had gone there the year before. And so they were looking for another American. And so it kind of just worked out like Sarah did so great there that they're like, let's hope this next American does great. And I didn't score like as many goals as Sarah did, but like hopefully I helped a little bit. But like playing there was really great. Um, the team was great. We were in Champions League. We won uh, the Norwegian Cup. We won the league. So like it was a great team to play on. Yeah, I think I think that's always like almost scarred me in a way because when you play for the Cup of Norway, you're playing in front of the King of Norway. Yeah. When you went to Sweden, you play in front of like 300 people. Like they, if you want to do the cup, Norway does it right. I think what they do. What did you guys? I think there was like 15, 17,000 people in the stadium. I mean, it felt like it. We yeah. were exhausted by the time we played the final because we had just done Champions League before. I think we were at Everton. So like we had traveled so much yeah. um, and we like eked out a 1-0 win, but like really cool how they celebrated there. Definitely. Did you learn anything from playing in Champions League? that you wouldn't have learned if you would have stayed in the States? Um, I think it's just a completely different competition. Obviously, I'd never done like kind of that aggregate home and away. So mm -hmm. there's just kind of this added pressure on playing at home and not giving up goals and then being away and like pushing for goals. And I had always like had dreams of playing in England. It just seemed from watching Premier League, it seemed like so glamorous and so getting to go to Everton and play. Everton and we also went to Russia so we were in like the edge of Siberia playing a Russian team so like when am I ever gonna go to Russia and play a club team there so it was just really cool experiences. Yeah. Um, a big part of your success in defense is a relation relationship and communication between the defenders and the goalkeepers. Do you specifically work with this or does it come naturally from being with each other every day in training? Uh, a little bit of both you have to work on it sometimes you just don't have that like really natural chemistry and so you have to actually like force it in a way and sometimes you have to adapt to the people around you if they've got a certain like skill set and so that takes a little bit of time to like get to know the people around you and then how you best complement them and yeah. so some of the best backlines i've ever played on i didn't have to really adapt my game everyone was able to play to their like strengths um, and that's been like a really rare occurrence, but when it happens, it's like, it feels so awesome. You know, you're in like the zone as we call it. Yeah. Um, what is your match day routine and has it changed since you started playing? Match day routine has not changed. It's usually like huge breakfast, uh, reading, gaming, like a little bit of like getting away from the stress of the, the match, the upcoming match. 
and then lunch and I usually try to take a nap like right after lunch and that kind of takes you into like pre-game meal and then game time yeah okay um the way that league has has existed in the U.S. means that players are often changing clubs sometimes on annual basis does that make you a better player because you have to keep adapting or can it stop players from fulfilling their potential I think it's both I think you find some journeymen or journey journey women I guess I should say um that really don't get their foothold on teams but then you have some that like every team they go on they're like a leading scorer coming off the bench and so I think it really depends on the type of player in person um so I've seen it work both ways yeah I think it was unique for me to come to Sweden at 30 and actually be in one place for a year at a time because yeah. in the US it's six months then you say okay I I can't recall how many pots or sofas or pans. I mean, now I think it's better because you need to go into like the nicer apartments and things are provided. Like I know Orlando has a great setup, for example. But I mean, if you just think about it, it's just so normal for us to go six months, six months. And every else in the world, they're like, that's crazy. It's a two-year contract, you stay, you do your thing, and then you go. Yeah, um, it is. It is wild. Have you ever, have you always seen yourself as a captain or is it something you've had to learn and how to do it successfully? Oh no, I never really saw myself as a captain. I, it's something I've always wanted to be able to be, but like until I was named a captain to my first team, which I think was like maybe my club team, but if we're talking about like youth national team, I wasn't named a captain until like U16. And I was just like, what are you doing? Like it came out of nowhere. I had no idea what was happening. Um, but like I always thought that inherently I had something not captainly about me I think maybe because I am so introverted like how does an introvert lead extroverts yeah. but actually that dynamic it works it actually really works and and I've actually like learned that sometimes it's good to be an introvert on a team of extroverts because it just offers a different dynamic that allows them to be them and me to be me um, and so I don't know what coaches keep seeing in me but like I'm often called <laughs> named captain um, and so yeah, it's just like a huge honor on any team that I've been named captain and a huge responsibility and I try not to mess it up, but it's hard. It's really hard. And I think with you, I mean, we played only I think one season or new 23s, but for you it's like when you don't say a lot, when you say something a lot of people listen. Yeah, I I've, I've, I've noticed that as I've gotten older like yeah. if I'm not talking just to talk. Um and so when I when I actually do say something, maybe it it weighs a little bit heavier. I'm just thinking of all the American stereotypes I've heard throughout my career. You know, we love to talk in many ways. Um, <laughs> you have, I actually didn't know this. You have been named in the NWL's, NWSL Best 11 every year since 2013, which is remarkable. Does an incredible individual achievement like that ever outweigh success as a team? For example, in Kansas, you won back to back, right? So does, do you have, I mean, I can answer this, I think, for you because you guys don't have <laughs> Becky's humble um, attitude, but. <laughs> I mean, obviously you don't go into season thinking about it, are you just thankful for it, or you probably didn't know um, that you've been for six years straight? Actually, like, I, of course, you know the answer to this, like, I'll take a championship over any individual accolade any day, like winning in 2014 and 2015 with Kansas City was unreal, like the team, it was just such like a great, cohesive, wonderful environment. And so those individual accolades are just like icing on the cake. Yeah. But like I've I've obviously like won that award in seasons where we don't even make playoffs and it's just kind of like I don't deserve this. Like you need to be winning championships in order to deserve this. And so yeah, give me a championship any day. It's funny, we were just talking about we haven't seen each other I think for seven years now. Like legit seen each other and I'm so happy you have not changed a bit. <laughs> so it like Of course not. <laughs> it really it really warms my heart. Seriously. Good. Good. I'm glad. That's what, yeah. Okay, last question for a club. You have seen American soccer change over, or I guess, what would you say the three most important things that you've seen in the last 15 years? You've been doing this now. What are the three biggest things you've seen, like the NWSL or I guess professional leagues in general? How has it changed? We'll say for the better. Okay, so I would say like on the business side, I think it's gotten better that we've found sponsors, owners have like deeper pockets. I think the front office staff is more willing to like search for ways to become more stable. And then you also have the federation who is putting money into the league as well. So I think 
the league in itself has just gotten more stable because it's found more money. Um, and then on like this actual American playing style, I'd say that we've actually changed quite a bit in the last decade from when I started with the national team to now where I would like to think we're a bit more dynamic when it comes to like being able to pass a ball and <laughs> different type of tactics to break teams down. Cause I think we've always had like, everyone probably thinks like, oh, American football, it's like route one. Like you kick it long, you chase after it, you high press and then you score the goal. Yep. Um, I think we've gotten, Perception. <laughs> Yep. I think we've gotten a little bit more savvy now um, where we, we can break down defenses that are like in lower blocks or mid blocks. And I think we're always going to stay true to our identity. Um, and that's like the American mentality, that's uh, resiliency, like never giving up. Like we're always going to have that in our identity and our DNA. Uh, but I think we've added more on the tactical side and also the technical side. I think you can see at 2019 World Cup, we actually have players, especially younger players like a Rose Lavelle who are gifted um, with like breaking pressure on their own and like creating their own chances. And I think uh, we need more of those types of players. And I think they're kind of coming up through the youth system. But I would say those are probably three things that have changed American soccer for the better. Yeah, I think you can't just say um, USA is just athletes anymore. You know, I think we're, we've developed over the time to be real footballers. You know, that's yeah, a huge sure. step in the right direction. We'll go into your U.S. time here. First question, how did you find out you've been called up to the national team for the first time? The first time was in 2008 and I had just finished my collegiate eligibility and I got an email from the general manager at the time. Um, and I was with Zola in my college apartment and I just remember celebrating, hugging him and then being like, stop, I need to write my email and say, yes, I'll come into camp. I was like, stop celebrating, like let me do my business now. So that was the first time that I got called in. And, you know, I have to laugh because you I don't know many people that have been out of college for 12 years and still have their college email. Dude, I, I love it. I can't I get rid of it. It's actually still possible. <laughs> well, it's Googled, it, it's like powered by Gmail, so it's fine. I can have <laughs> it for life, they told me. <laughs> okay, does playing for your national team age groups prepare you to making your debut for the full team? Or is oh, it definitely. a ball game? Uh, I think, no, it absolutely helped me. And I think first, like being selected to that first youth national team and you're like, oh my gosh, like I really have to establish myself. And like, it just challenges you. And I don't think you necessarily get that challenge if you just play with your club team or so and then playing in youth world cups. Like I played in 2004 in Thailand with the 19s, um, the Nordic cups with you with the 23s, 21s. And this does it. What's up? Does the Nordic Cup still exist? I think so. I think it might not be called Nordic Cup anymore, but I think there is still some sort of tournament for that age group. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's still a huge jump to get to the senior team. I mean, that's why it's the senior team. But I think like you slowly like make your way through the program. And if you're lucky like you, you just jump straight to the 23s. But like I started when I was like freaking 14. I did just a couple less um, fitness tests than you did throughout your career, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, how does training with the national team differ to club training? Um, I think like you, you would think that there would be a jump from the NWSL to the national team when it comes to just like the skill ability, but like that's not really what the difference is I think between national team players and the NWSL. I think it's like the consistency of like showing up every single day and really like giving your all and being focused and being extremely coachable and like being you know, like doing what's been asked of you and so I think with the national team it's just like every single day you're getting the best out of everybody whereas I think with professionals sometimes like they're still trying to find that consistency and like how to maintain that over a course of an entire season. I also think the pressure I mean of course you have you have game pressure but like when you're in a national team and you come in, it's like your first training where you're warming up, especially when you're new, your 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 heart is like in your throat or your stomach yeah. because it's like, and when you change a coach, which you've been a couple times to the national team, it's like you always have these new standards. And like you said, if you do bad on the beep test or I'm not sure what you guys run now for fitness, <laughs> <laughs> like it's not just you did bad, but then it's like you see the standards of these top fit professionals 
and you know that this is the level that you have to be at. Mm -hmm. No, totally. No, that's a great, great point too. Um, what did you learn from being part of the 2011 World Cup squad that you used to help you to be successful at later tournaments? Oh man, so 2011 probably like showed me that amazing things can happen in a game. Like even when you think you're out, you're a man down, uh, you're down a goal in double overtime. Like that showed me that anything is possible when Abby Wambach scored that goal to put us into to PKs. Like, I'd never been a part of a game like that where something like that miraculous happened. But then the opposite happened to us too in the final when we played Japan and they equalized yeah. in the last like remaining minutes of the match. And so it was a tournament that showed me that like you have to see out every single game to the absolute last second. Cause soccer, like you just have to be prepared and just you have to stay focused the entire time. And so I took that all the way through even now when I'm playing. Um, my niece thinks I'm like the coolest person for talking to you and she actually <laughs> has a question for you. She said, um, and I think it goes along with everyone, but when you won the World Cup in 2015, like what was that feeling? Just so much emotion. I mean, you guys worked so hard. You, you worked for years. This is like your, you know, your dream here. And then it happens. Is it surreal? Is it something that you'll never forget? Or is it more all the moments leading up to that moment that you remember most? I mean, I remember for me personally, like I had never, aside from 2012 Olympics, like won something that big, but I hadn't really played that much in the Olympics. And so for me personally, 2015 was the first time I was on a team where I like physically contributed to the win. Like I was playing significant minutes. I played significant minutes up until the tournament. So for me, it was like really personally gratifying that like, I thought maybe I was just gonna be like a perennial loser, like was worried I just didn't have that winning mentality in me that you see in a lot of other people. So for me, it was like, okay, like I, I'm, I can also win. I can be a winner. Um, and I also remember feeling like such relief because it had been so long since the Americans had won a World Cup since 99. So we had all this pressure on our shoulders and to finally like get to feel that and like get to the mountaintop after you've been like slogging along trying to climb it, like it's such a good feeling. Um, do you think there's a difference from the 2012? Okay, obviously you were more involved, but is there a difference from winning Olympics and a World Cup? Do you feel oh, that? There's yeah, there's a difference because like the Olympics, I think like Americans in particular like hold the Olympics like on a huge pedestal. Um, so winning the Olympics is unbelievable, like such a great feeling. But you're also like one little team in like a huge group of teams like you're one small part of team usa and so it's not just for women's soccer and so winning the olympics unbelievable like winning a world cup like that is women's soccer like that is like our highest most visible platform and like it's that's just really special uh my partner she has the gold medal from 2016 and like i don't i completely agree because in europe i think it's a big deal but like as a kid you grow up watching olympics Yes, the men's World Cup, okay, a little bit with women, but like to see an actual gold medal. And then I always joke like a gold medal or an Olympic medal, it's like huge and it's heavy. Yeah. You see the World Cup medal and it's like, yeah. you know, and you're like, it, ba <laughs> it barely has like an engraving on it. I think mine might, might say champions from 2019, but I'm not sure. It's like, it's like you could buy it almost, you know, if you didn't know what it was, you'd think it's like something you got at like a tournament. <laughs> It's the Olympic. <laughs> um, okay. Did you have a different experience winning your first, your first and second World Cup, or does winning a World Cup always feel the same? Because you guys obviously just won it this summer. Well, I mean, it always feels wonderful. Like that's never going to go away. I think 2019 was a lot harder. I think we played like France, and France could have been a final. England in the semifinal could have been a final. Netherlands obviously was the final, but like the amount of progress from some of the teams that were kind of like dark horses in, in 2015 were like legit contenders in 2019. And so it felt like we really had to earn 2019. I mean, no one, like you said, no one can argue that you guys are world champions because your side of the bracket was just insane. Like you said, there was three massive games that I was like, okay, this is the final. 
this is the final. And the other side, bless their hearts, was still hard. It's the World Cup, but it's like there was there was nothing compared to this side. Yeah, and if Australia, like Australia, was then on our side, if they hadn't lost to Norway, like we could have met them somewhere along the way, like it would have. Yeah, that side of the bracket was wild. I was like, how did we get here? No one can argue 2019 U.S. was definitely the best team. Um, the U.S. national team transcends beyond the pitch, inspiring women globally. Does this add extra pressure to perform and get to get results when you do play matches? It's so hard for me to speak so much English in a day. I'm so I'm sorry. sorry. You're doing great. I do Spanish and German, but this is <laughs> words transcends. Yeah. I mean, you sound great. Um, so we know that we have to be successful on the pitch in order to stay relevant. I think Americans like really love winners. And so for us, like we know that if we want public support on our side, it helps that we're a very successful team. Mm. And so it, it does add a little bit of pressure, but I think we like accept that pressure and we, we kind of like like to have it because it gives us that extra edge, like where we know we have to perform and we have to get results. Um, and I think we have a, a group of a pool of players that like, like perform better under that pressure, which I think is pretty rare. Um, so yeah, like we know that being successful helps us. Okay, we got three more here and it says, which of all of your career center back partnerships, national team or club, do you feel you learned the most from? Oh, interesting, uh, that I learned the most from. I think, I think I learned the most when I was with JJ. So Julie, Julie Ertz, um, she had just, just like got onto the roster, got onto the starting lineup. And so for me having this brand new player, like we're leading right into the 2015 World Cup, how much I had to learn about her and the back line in general so quickly with so much pressure on our backs like I think for me like it brought my game to a different level because I basically had to add all these tools to my like toolkit to make sure that our backline could function the best that it could um, and that was like allowing others to shine and like I think in 2015 like JJ was such like a hammer like she was just destroying plays and for me it was like learning how to sweep everything up and like for just provide like safety yeah. Um, which added like a nice little, a nice little level to my game. <laughs> I'm just thinking of all the commentary that you nailed it. That was probably the sums up the 2015. Yep. <laughs> um, okay. When you reach the level that you have and you've been winning trophies, you've been considered one of the best defenders in the world. How do you ensure you stay motivated and keep improving? Like you said, you joined what national team when you were 16 or the youth. So you've been, <laughs> I've been in it. <laughs> I've been in it. Um, I think it's because I keep want like I keep wanting to win things, and so it's so fun winning. And like honestly, like we won twenty fifteen, and the next thing that we were thinking about was okay, let's win twenty sixteen. Obviously, we didn't. But then thinking like okay, let's win twenty nineteen, and now we've won twenty nineteen. We're like okay, let's win twenty twenty. Okay, wait, there is no Olympics twenty twenty. Let's win twenty one. So it's like you get onto the mountaintop, and like you're literally looking like for the next mountaintop to climb. Um, so for me, it's like, can I stay at a level where I can be on this team and help this team keep climbing to different mountaintops? And so that's what's motivating for me as I get older is like, can I keep my level high? Can I keep growing my game? Can I become like savvier and more tactical and more technical? But like physically, I'm not as strong as I was at like 23, you know? So there's just like different challenges now. Do you think I mean, how do you feel about the Olympics being moved? This isn't a question, but does this affect you or you just say, okay, we're going to grind it out, keep going. This is part of our journey or our, our story. I mean, it gives you more time with Black, Black Co, which is really nice, I'm sure. Um, were you sad and were you affected by it or for you just saying, okay, this is the way it is, let's go? This is the way it is, let's go. I mean, <laughs> to have it, to have it right now in this year in July would just be so irresponsible and put people at risk of contracting COVID. Like, I, I can't even imagine if we had had it in July because people haven't even qualified for the Olympics yet. And so forcing these people to like have contact sports is just insane. So super glad they moved it. And this is just, nobody knows what the hell is happening right now. And so you just have to take it as it is and just roll with the punches. 
This is okay. This is not. There's two questions. One's kind of fun. Um, if you had to pick a dodgeball team from your U.S. teammates, who's making the team? I don't know. How much is in dodgeball? Five people. Uh, let's go with five. Okay, five. Okay, uh, Alyssa Nair for sure. Like she can toss the ball out for sure. Um, Kelly O'Hara because she's crazy. Um, <laughs> Sam Mewis because she's very strong and powerful. Um, let's see. I'd go with Lynn Williams, mm -hmm. and then just the freaking nature, right? Athletically, she's just yeah, man. I mean, she's just strong all over, but she's also like super agile, so she could be like dodging and dipping and stuff. And then I need one more. Um, let's go with Julie JJ. Great. She'd like sacrifice herself. I mean, I don't know her at all, but probably she's... yeah. That would yeah. Okay, and then last question. How do you hope people will remember you when you decide to retire? Oh, that's a, a great question. Um, so I hope my teammates more, more like I care more what my teammates think about me than what the rest of the world thinks about me. But like, I hope my teammates think like, there was a player who like, really put the team before herself. Like team success was so much more important to her than individual success. And I hope that's what people think about me because that's kind of how I've tried to conduct myself throughout my career is always trying to do what was best for the team, even if that meant diminishing my role or like allowing others to shine and me kind of like staying beneath the radar. And like, so I hope people think of me in that way. All right. That's, that sums it up. I think that's, <laughs> you've gotten all the, the questions done here. Uh, so thank you so much Beck, for taking the time. <laughs> Of course. I, I think I've laughed more on this one than I have others because you're exactly the same, which again, it melts my heart. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad I'm the same. And I hope to see you sooner than later. That would be nice. That'd be really I nice. Good luck with everything. <laughs>